The 2019 FIDE World Cup rolls on, now officially in round two. So many exciting matchups, so many exciting games went down today from Conti Monsisk. So when I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to record our first video on, I did what a lot of people do when they're looking for answers. They go to social media. Why do we do that? But anyway, I asked uh, all of my Twitter following. You can get at me there at Daniel Wrench. What video you wanted to see first? Uh, you have spoken. 375 of you really wanted to see the Nissa Piano Nakamura game. But I'm going to give a shout out to a god Mator who actually covered that game first and unintentionally i sort of dove into this nihal sarin victory over el taj safarli and not only was i super impressed with the young man from india but I, I couldn't i couldn't close the analysis i loved it i loved the game from start to finish and so i hope you forgive me and will, will still follow me even though i invited 375 of you and now i'm now i'm not going to do that video first uh but um i'm going to dive into this nihal sarin game versus el taj safarli because I really feel like it was a model I don't want to use the term immortal, but a great game showing why Nihal Sarin is getting scary good. The young man from India has developed quite a fan base online, especially in the chess.com community. Recently played in the Junior Speed Chess Championship, and a lot of people looking at him as maybe an early eye on a future potential world champion, maybe at least a world championship candidate. So let's dive in and see exactly what it was about this game that had us all so excited. So we started out with the move E4, and these two guys played about as traditional a route Lopez as as you see any of the world's elite play in the Spanish. Uh, we didn't get a Berlin, which we see so often these days, right? Thank our lucky stars. We had a main line with a6, and after bishop a4, knight f6 castles, we're going down a uh, very, very main line row. We didn't even see an archangelesque, angel, whatever you want to call it, archangel, for those who just speak uh, speak the, the most basic elementary way to say it, um, which is one of the sharper, more aggressive ways for black to play these days. No, we didn't. We just had bishop e7, a traditional Spanish after rookie one b5 and bishop b3 uh, we've reached a very very common position in the roy lopez and so I'm not going to spend time backing up and explaining and on any more basic levels why we got here. You can find this opening pretty much everywhere on any chess website. I try to generally tell as much of the storyline as I can for the entire uh, level of different chess understanding so that everyone can follow follow uh, why we're in the current position. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to explain the first seven moves. I am going to stop right here and try to give you guys a little bit of context as to why D6 is played these days. So. D6 is played um, to immediately defend the E5 pawn, which opens up the threat, positional threat of knight A5 to win the bishop pair, right? You can't move this knight from C6 as long as it's needed to guard E5. Uh, the drawback of this move order by Safarli is that you're, you're taking away your opportunities to potentially get the marshal. Uh, the marshal gambit occurs when black castles, and if white plays the most common theoretical move here, you can look up C3. D5 is the marshal gambit, right? And we've seen a lot of great games in this line where white wins the pawn, but Black eventually relocates the pieces and gets a very, very big attack. The thing is, though, that modern preparation has white pretty much knowing what to do in the marshal, and so Black is no longer looking for this trick, quote-unquote, to get this very aggressive line, at least not at the highest levels. So with that in mind, there really isn't a great reason to give White the option of either inviting it or even playing h3, which declines the marshal. Um, and just to give some quick educational tips there, the reason h3 sort of declines the marshal is because if you go for these lines now as Black, h3 is a more useful defensive move, and it keeps the c3 square open and available. You haven't played c3, so White's queenside development doesn't have the normal dysfunction that it has in the marshal. So uh, turning into a bit of a Ruy Lopez lesson here, but that, that's sort of some of the idiosyncrasies of this line, uh, what these players are thinking about at a high level. Um, and so D6 is played as a way to say, I know I'm not going to go for the marshal anyway. I want to try to win the bishop pair and make sure you're not going to let me get those variations because those tend to be pretty good for black. So of course, Sarin says, I'm not going to let you get that. I play C3 to keep my bishop pair. I like my bishops. Um, now, some people might look at this and say, well, this move order was C3 instead of H3. Doesn't that allow bishop g4. Um, I'll make a quick note on that, just that while bishop g4 for a long time was seen as um, a very advantageous thing for black, and, and certainly, um, let's say if black castles and white made the mistake of not playing h3 and play d4 now, now bishop g4 is very good. Uh, games here will be good for black, and the engines will like this position for black, as now white has really committed the d-pawn, and so this pin is, is highly irritating, right? You don't want me to take it and either win d4 or you have to double your pawns. So bishop g4 here would 
would be irritating, but if white hasn't played d4, this move is not seen as, as good as it maybe once was. White can play some traditional plans here, d3, knight d2, do things like bring this, uh, not that knight, do things like bring this knight on d2 around to f1 and g3, and often what ends up happening is this bishop ends up being more of a target in some ways for black. It's kind of a, an irritation, a nuisance, uh, and, and it's mainly because white knows now if you get that pin, I'm not going to just be as aggressive as I would be, and I, I'll go for a more positional plan. So these are the reasons that we we didn't see certain moves, right? And so a lot, a lot of explanation here. Hopefully, if you're a Rui Lopez player, you appreciate this. If you already know all this, then uh, I apologize. Forgive me. Bear with the video. We're going to get to some pretty exciting stuff here. So... Um, c3 was played and after rekarovka we have h3 of course to stop bishop g4 all right not d4 and now we get knight to b8 now this is the start of the briar variation which is uh of a very modern um it was very very popular in the late 90s early 2000s for black um kind of right before the berlin sort of took over for black the the idea is very simple black wants flexibility wants to bring this knight to d7 because from d7 it has two things in mind yes it wants to help with the traditional queen side we're going to see that in this game that black is playing for in in the spanish but the knight on d7 can also in some cases head over to f8 right and maybe even e6 or even help out over here on the king side when we know white wants an attack so the whole point of the briar is is for black to just get a flexible move right i know it's an undeveloping move and, and beginner chess players are like right mind blown you can't play that but it has it has a purpose and it teaches us play Play with a plan not just with the pieces the pieces should be part of your plan so sometimes if a move looks optically weird or, or or seems like it's breaking principles if it's part of the overall plan that you can justify often you can get away with such things so so that's what i would say about knight b8 um, knight a5 is the more traditional move for black and and those variations again would go like this something like this in a lopez and queen c7 um, and what we will see is ideas like a4 as sarin played in the game aren't as popular here because black is ready to keep expanding on the queen side this knight a5 line in c5 is a little more aggressive. Plus, that bishop is often coming to d7 here rather than b7 as it did in the game. So those are those are some other variations, more the Chigorin uh, Rui Lopez if you're looking up opening names. So knight b8, d4, knight bd7, the knight comes to d2. We know this is a very typical plan in the Lopez for white. We get bishop b7, bishop c2, and after rook e8, knight f1. Again, this is just all theory, all been played literally thousands of times in the database. Black plays bishop f8 rather than knight f8, because here knight f8 would actually just lose this pawn. So you can't play it yet, plus bishop f8 has a relocation idea in mind. And that, of course, is to play the move g6, which both serves defensive purposes on the light squares, but also you're kind of fee and kettoing by hand, right, the slow way. Uh, moving the bishop on f8 also makes sense for black to open the center. So this all makes sense. And now the move a4, as I kind of prophesize, we don't see that in the Chigorin. We do see that in the Briar for white. What's the difference? Well, again, in the Chigorin, black was already more primed to get going on the queen side, and this bishop is often on this diagonal. But a4 here is really important to remember, whether you're a Lopez player or just learning to expand and your positional chess knowledge. When your opponent advances pawns that can't return, often they can become targets in the sense where if you can add tension where you know a trade can only be good for you, always add that tension, right? If you can add tension and you know you can build on it, right? It's like water hitting a dam. It keeps hitting it because it knows that the tension can only favor it. If the dam's either going to hold me or it's going to break, right? So kind of see pawn tension as something you always want to build on. What do we mean by that? Well, it almost never favors black to take this pawn in these structures because no matter how I take back, you're left with two pawns pawn islands, meaning an isolated a6 pawn, right, just on an open file, and white's pawn structure is very healthy. And so from that perspective, you'll see players add tension and key points and positions because they can build on that. Um, and that's a key theme to, to um, Nihal Sarin's strategy in this game. a4, and after the move bishop g7, we get the move that only happens in the briar, and that's bishop d3. Again, you wouldn't see it in variations where black has the bishop here in the Chagorin or the knight on a5. You, now you're really trying to add to that tension, right? You're hoping the pawn will break and give you great positional targets for the rest of the game because black doesn't want that he has to settle on c6 so this is how white gets an edge in the briar right we know that the pawn on c6 probably not your favorite square also potentially weakens the d6 pawn as that pawn now lacks protection that's kind of a key point because now we see uh, a variation chosen by Sar and Bishop G5 that was played also by Magnus Carlsen against uh, Grandmaster uh, Baramidzi in Baden Baden, Germany, uh, 2015. And th this line with Bishop G5 has become very popular, uh, maybe not totally since that game, but I always make note of whenever Magnus Carlsen has played a particular opening. Bishop E3 is actually uh, uh, just as common, um, but. 
the whole point of bishop g5 is you're willing to go to e3 but only after they played h6 because as happened in the game now we have a target here right sometimes we see loss of tempos and it confuses us but here we have a target to help our assault um in the game uh carlson baramizi black actually didn't play h6 and played knight f8 but when you didn't kick my bishop from g5 i never gave you the chance again if my magnus carlson queen d2 to bring my bishop to h6 um and of course that's not to say that white was winning by force or anything but Carlson did eventually go on to win by using the d file and highlighting the thing I said earlier that the pawn on c6 left the d pawn weak uh Magnus executed a pretty nice combination here where he went to an endgame and d6 fell and ultimately was in a very very good spot as white so um, that's one game to note. Uh, always try to do my homework and preparation for you guys so I understand these positions. I think it makes me a better teacher and, and, and can explain it. Um, and so, you know, that's some of the shuffling that's going on here and why you see often with bishop g5 now, black will play h6. Uh, you don't want to allow the battery, queen d2 and bishop h6, basically. So h6, bishop e3. Now we have the bishop on e3 as we did before, but we have a target. And after queen c7, Sauron played queen to d2. King to h7 to guard the pawn. But then b4. This move has a lot to take note about. Get your notepad out, right? Be like, Mom, I'm watching a chess video. I'm learning. Leave me alone, right? Get, remove your distractions right now so you can focus here. Uh, B4 does things positionally on the queen side that we like to do in Rui Lopez as if we're white. Slow down black's expansion. But it also has a very big picture purpose there. You can pause the video if you really want to. Three, two, one. The idea is you're actually opening up communication from both the queen side to the king side. Aha, right? Taste the soup. Aha, right? The f7 pawn has been left by the king. And now there's going to be full board opportunities to expose the king who's who's trying to help both Peshki here, and he can't really do that job. So b4 is, is by the way, has still been played. Um, and, and in fact, the first novelty we get is actually right here. But I, I would say already b4 is kind of the key idea, and I would bet it was part of Sauron's preparation. Uh, Safarli played knight to b6, which I have my theories I'm going to show you as to why what I think he miscalculated, because I don't think knight b6 is probably the best. Uh, one thing to note is one of the games that was played earlier in this line had d5, but I did my homework, analyzed it myself, and, and used the engine to check my lines, but I think the improvement Sauron had planned was to take e5, and after takes, rather than taking with the knight on e4, which is what was played in the game Zig Zigalko versus Dolezal um, in uh, 2007, he was going to take with the bishop on e4, and after takes, takes with the knight. He's given black the bishop Pair. But in the end, with this line, knight c5 and bishop, excuse me, bishop d4 coming, I think white is actually just positionally much, much better. Uh, that knight on c5 is a, is a dominant piece against kind of a, a Franken pawn over there on b7. So I think that was his improvement. Safarli doesn't go for that. I looked at this position for a while. I think rook 88, if we get this position again amongst high level grandmasters, will probably be the try for black. Um, I think that's just a little bit more flexible and Basically, he would gain almost a full two tempi by black as, as what we're going to see in the game for Safarli. So I think rook 88 is the improvement for those looking for that. Um, but knight b6 was played, trying to come to the queen side. But after the move takes e5 and a5, I think that unless you were planning on doing something with the knight aggressively... I can't really justify this move knight b6. Uh, knight c4 would clearly be a bad idea, right? Uh, this is a horrible pawn, and white probably picks it up quickly. Knight a4 is, I think, what Safarli had in mind originally, but what he might have miscalculated was that after bishop c2, rook d8, first glance might be, oh, I'm picking up a pawn. You can't go for variations like this. The queen has to move. But if you go a little further, you see the pawn is actually poisoned because taking would allow bishop b6. And so if that would be the case, then your knight would be stuck on a4, and I'm going to take it and probably win a pawn on the next move. So it's not a very complicated variation, but something tells me that there was just a basic miscalculation there to lose this significant time. If you just look at this position compared to the one I recommended Black should have if you had just played rook a to d8, you have the same position, but you're, you have the rook on the d file, and you're ready to deal with the tension. Uh, you're, like I said, basically have two moves here because you didn't have to you know bounce around with the pony. Um, after this, Sauron really starts to put on the strategic jets. He plays c4. This is, again, on my educational tip that hopefully you're making note of to add to tension when it favors you. Can black ever take here and be happy about it? Bringing a bishop to this diagonal and isolating a6 and c6? The answer is probably no, right? So if that's the case, you add to that tension. It gives you more space, more squares to use, and more opportunities for your opponent to go wrong. After rook to d8, we see queen a2. Again, that full board awareness coming back with the, with the move b4 I highlighted earlier. And oh man, I'm already getting frisky over here on that f7 pawn. 
After the king goes back to guard it, bishop to c2, because I want more pressure. And this is when it really, really becomes key. After queen to d6, you can pause the video if you want to guess uh, what Sauron is able to play here. But this is kind of the key point to realizing how dysfunctional Black's position is about to become and how well thought out this approach was by Sauron. He played the move, bishop to b3, laughing in the face of danger for obvious reasons. If you take it, it may be several things. I could even try c5, try to play at the idea that I'm trapping the queen and taking f7, but even c takes b5 is good. So when bishop b3 came, black had to back up and guard the uh, the pawn on f7, but now natural moves lead us to this position where uh, white just really starts to show that black's pieces are struggling, they're wrestling each other for safe squares, and white has a lot more dynamic uh, firepower here than first meets the eye. And what we mean by that is whenever you recognize the potential of weaknesses, queen and bishop battery on f7, right? We already talked about these two pawns being weak earlier in, in, in the game. The fact that you control the only open file. Those things have gathered like little advantages you've been kind of gathering, the infinity stones, and now you just got to have the guts, right, to make the snap, okay? Because when you get all of those things, one, one cue is... If you really feel like all your pieces are close to being on their best squares, but you can't see a concrete knockout blow, you might want to work harder, meaning probably the knockout blow is there. Some sort of strong idea is there whenever you have all your pieces on, on very good squares, because because how are you going to improve them from here, right? So that's a cue to tell yourself, you know what, this isn't me just, if I keep fiddling, he might untie his pieces, get the other rook to d8, move the knight to f8, start trading, right? So if you waste time when all your pieces are on best squares, you might have missed your opportunity. So that's a cue that I've, a muscle I've built for myself in chess where if I'm not convinced there's better squares for my pieces, it's time to work hard and find something concrete. All that said, there's one better square for one particular piece, even though in doing so really makes the position very concrete. So I'm kind of answering both riddles with one move, and that move was knight to h4. Very, very strong. You literally can't stop the idea of me opening this diagonal and doing devastatingly dirty things on g6. I'm going to play c5, take, and then the f7 pawn is pinned, and I'm just playing knight takes g6. Boom, right? how do you stop it, right? It's very, very difficult to do so. Uh, if you move the king to h7, now I can do either take or push and f7 just falls right away. So I'm just winning on the spot. Um, if you can't go to f7 to unpin the f7 pawn, going to h8 would also lose the pawn because you release the protection of f7. Those things make it very clear why we saw king f8 by Safarli. He's saying, well, I can't move the king anywhere else without losing f7, but I can't just sit here and stare down the barrel of the gun. I have to move because of the pin, right? So I go to f8, and now white, uh, white brings the pain. c5. Now, I analyzed this, and I think that you could have already seen the winning combination that Sauron did in the game right here, but I'm not going to show it to you because I want you to have a chance to find it, and it almost doesn't matter because the move order transposes. c5 opens up threats of rook to d6. It also, on a principled level, this is where you can really learn, stops all counterplay. When you know you're about to just crush somebody on one side of the board, stop, stop allowing queen takes b4. Stop allowing ideas of taking or even c5 to open up the rook and bishop. Even if those things probably aren't good for your opponent, don't even don't even allow it right from a practical point of view put the clamps down and and eliminate counterplay poke fun at the ugly bad bishop over there and then do your worst on the king side after knight to b8 that's exactly what happens rook to d6 the rook moves to d8 and you have about 30 seconds no you don't you have about five seconds before i tell you the answer pause the video if you want um, and this is the move order that could have been played earlier but finally it comes knight g to f5 exclaim a bitch right boom give the respect to the father name it deserves right add a bitch onto the end knight g to f5 sacrificing a piece and blowing things open i spent too much time analyzing all the different ways white could win here uh Sarin chose knight takes g7 i actually liked bishop takes h6 in the end is my favorito uh enjoy that with your new tasty snack doritos right my, that was my favorito of course if you take here i just take with check and then take here with tempo and also everybody falls so bishop takes h6 was fun. Sarin played knight takes g7 a little more concrete based on the fact that king takes runs into bishop takes h6. Everybody's crashing through. Rook takes f6. If you go back to the seventh rank, you lose the lady. Rook takes f7. So the king runs up. But after rook f5 check and king h6, you can pause the video one last time if you want to find the forced mate here for white. It begins with, drumroll, 
queen to e2. No way to stop the move queen to h5 or queen g4 and rook h5. Uh, you can choose your flavor flav, right? So um, just an absolutely fantastic execution here. Almost a perfect game analyzing it with the computers. And, and I always like to analyze these games by myself first so I can teach myself the position, remind myself of the opening, prepare the human notes I want to give you guys as your, as your chess coach if you're watching this video, at least temporarily. Um, and then I like to go back and check with the engine both to see how the players play and whether my analysis was accurate. And like I said, analyzing it, I think that white was already in a position where knight f5 could have been played now because things like this with the queen getting chased and then taking b5 followed by rook c1. This position is you're down a piece, but the engine say white is still just completely winning. So it's possible this was, this was you know, on the table right away, but I really can't fault the human execution of c5, put down the clamps. I felt like that was actually the better thing that everyone could learn from, not knight g to f5 by the engine. So anyway, hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you're enjoying the coverage here, bringing you these videos from Conti Monsisk, not from Conti Monsisk, from my office here where I live, but uh, following the games live from the FIDE World Cup. Uh, you can get at me on Twitter, leave a comment here, give us a subscription to the, to the YouTube chess channel. Um, and uh, thanks, uh, thanks for watching.